Hello everyone and welcome back to Bobbin's Minecraft Let's Play. You're watching FTB Infinity Skyblock Episode 9. Let's start today with a little bit of a tour of the base because I've made quite a few little changes including some expansion. One of the things I've been working on in this area right here is agricraft seeds. And these are the seeds that I've gotten up to 10, 10, 10 so far. I am going to need to do some crossbreeding to make some progress on the witchery seeds and the, the harvest craft seeds pretty soon. But I've got most of the dye seeds down and, and the sort of seeds for vanilla plants down as well. So that's how that's coming along. I am working on some of these resource seeds. I just got the diamond crop to grow in. That's great because I'm going to have to start automating diamonds. They're proving to be quite a bottleneck at the moment. I can't grow them in the forestry uh, farms, but I do have an idea how to get them without building additional automated farms. So that will that will be a good thing. I've also set, done some additional installation up here. The number of engines has doubled, and you can see that it's sending out a nice thick stream of power here. There are eight of these. Together with the survivalist generators over there, that means that I'm generating a total up here of 430 RF per tick. I'm not actually using quite that much just at this moment, so sometimes you see a couple of these engines temporarily stall. That's fine. I did set up automated crafting for fertilizer so that the farms will always have fertilizer available. I'm going to look at these uh, logistics crafting tables and some of the logistics pipes crafting later in this episode, so I'm not going to dwell on that in great detail. Over here I set up some dirt production. I'm supplying pumpkins using this supplier pipe to the hopper in the top. The hopper in the bottom pulls dirt out of the barrel where this logistics chassis Mark II has an extractor module in it to pull the dirt out. This is one of the few cases where I would consider using the, the extractor module rather than the extractor Mark II or the extractor Mark III because the extractor module is very slow. On the other hand, this oak barrel is also very slow. That's sort of what's going on over here. My next power upgrade up here will be quite soon, probably between episodes. I've got 17,000 charcoal here. I'd like to use some of that charcoal for fuel, so I think I'm going to go ahead and set up a boiler or two up here using railcraft boilers and steam engines, which will give me just a ton of additional power, and it will start to use up some of that charcoal so I don't have to go and do any new resource production for it. That will probably be enough power to tie me over until I get started with IC2 Nuclear, which is sort of the next big update. Once I go IC2 Nuclear, I'm probably not going to be depending on a central power plant to supply the base with power, because one of the things about that is that it produces plutonium as a side effect. Plutonium is something we'll need a lot of. It makes sense just to run a whole bunch of those reactors. So I'll probably just sort of distribute the power generation for manufacturing and stuff throughout the base. I may still have a big central power plant somewhere, but if I do, it's going to be for a special purpose, not for just powering all the machines just sort of around the base. So continuing the tour, let's come over here first because I've built some new platforms. I've built three of them. They're all empty right now, so they look sort of like this one. This one is on the side opposite where I previously set up the grassy area and the squid tank, and, and I've sort of set up the machinery that generates uh, metal ingots and, and other sorts of raw materials using X nylo. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. But here's the other two platforms, one down here, one up there. The one up there, I've knocked the wood out of the platform underneath the light so that the sun can shine through here on the bottom one. Makes it nice and, and lit up, so even though it's got this huge platform above it, it does not have a dungeon-like feel. These two are going to be used for manufacturing very soon. In fact, we'll set up a little manufacturing up on the top one today. I've sort of got that planned out. So let's take a look at this machine over here. This is actually producing raw materials using the various sorts of X-Nilo related machines. 
So it's taking cobble as an input. The cobble's coming in here into the pulverizer. It's getting made into gravel, sand, and dust. Mostly gravel because this particular setup is not very effective. It would be if we upgraded the bottom one a few times and upgraded this one maybe once or twice because you need to have more even generation of these resources and what's actually happening is it's just not generating enough gravel to send any of it up here and then as a result it's not generating enough sand to send any of it up here. So this is not really a terribly effective setup for generating equal amounts of resources from all three raw materials. It does mostly gravel. That's okay. Right now diamonds are a bottleneck and you get them from gravel so that's just sort of how that goes. There's basically a a row here for producing for processing gravel consisting of a sieve and a, an auto compressor to make ore blocks and then a hammer to smash the ore blocks. Mm -hmm. The smashed ore blocks will always go to the row behind for gravel and sand so that they get reprocessed and the final result is always the dust ore. So this one does the, the sand and over here we're doing dust. When it does get dust ores they go through this mechanism they come over to a pulverizer where they're pulverized which gives doubling plus a little bit of a bonus and they go into the redstone furnace. The exceptions are eulorium and aluminum which don't have pulverizer recipes. Aluminum can be doubled in the smeltery so I've just sort of manually been doing that. Eulorium can't be doubled at all, so I've just been manually smelting it. I could probably do something with pipes to bypass this to send it in here. I haven't done that yet, but eventually when I set up a more permanent version of this machine, this is really just temporary, I will. The other thing about setting up a permanent version of this machine is I'll probably try to be a little more space efficient with it and a little nicer in some ways and balance the production a little better. Mm -hmm. At the moment this was just sort of quickly put together to try and get something going. There is one nice little thing here that you might have noticed. There used to be a chest sitting where this logistics pipe was. That was when that was before I had set up storage. I was just having all the resources mm -hmm. sitting here in a big chest. I replaced it with this logistics pipe mm -hmm. to sort of bridge the two systems. The main item sorting and logistics pipe system is using these build craft pipes. It is possible to do it using thermodynamics item mm -hmm. ducts. However, right now I only have the basic item ducts available, and as you can see from the items moving through them, they're really slow. They're also more expensive than mm -hmm. these golden transport pipes, which are pretty fast, so I'm not using them for mm -hmm. that. But because the system does connect to both of these, it can be used as a bridge between the two systems. And so that's what's sort of going on here. So let's go up here and look at the storage for just a minute. I moved the default route for the system right here. It's more than a default route, route now because instead of just the item sync which gives it a default route, I added a provider and a quick sort so that this chest is now sort of an integrated part of the system. I can dump items in here and they will if they've got another location on the network where they belong they'll get pulled out of here and go to that location. Also if there is some demand for some item in this chest it will get pulled out of here and sent along as though this was a main storage location. Next to it, I've set up a request logistics pipe that's attached to a chest. This provides an interface when you click on it with a wrench that lets you request any of the items that the system knows about. So sugarcane, for example, is stored all the way on the other end of the network. I've got 5,000 of them, and if I wanted some sugarcane here, I could click on here, put in how many I want, hit request, and it would drag that sugarcane over across the network wherever it's stored but it's way over there and put it in this chest for me and it would get that specific amount and put it here very convenient the main storage system here is a wall of storage drawers it's actually connected up through this pipe that sort of runs through the middle of it the pipe is prevented from connecting on three sides by the use of buildcraft facades on the fourth side it connects directly to the drawer controller if we look at what's on this pipe, it is a Mark V logistics chassis, 
The only thing it's got right now are a provider module and a polymorphic item sync, which basically says anything that's here, store more of that here, and anything that's requested from here, send it out. The other six slots will eventually have um, active supplier modules because I'm also going to use this to cache some stuff that's been manufactured. Before I move on to logistics crafting, I do want to talk about one other thing. I started building a bunch of platforms and I decided I wanted some help. And so I made a turtle and I made a builder's wand. These actually consumed a lot of diamonds and they're one of the reasons I'm short on diamonds right now. The builder's wand requires 18 diamonds. The turtle doesn't require so many, but the turtle does have an issue with it that I wanted to talk about just a little bit. First, you'll notice this is not an upgraded turtle, it's just a regular one. It doesn't have the mining capability, for example. If we look at the recipe for the mining turtle, there is a recipe for it. You just turtle pickaxe. For whatever reason, even though this recipe shows, it doesn't work. So, you're not going to be able to make a mining turtle. I suppose you could cheat one in if you think this is a bug or something. Maybe that, maybe you'll do that. I didn't do that. I just settled for the regular turtle. The regular turtle has a much more complicated recipe than the default. Lots of diamond tools and some uh, intricate circuit boards from forestry and iron chipset. These wheels, which I had already had some materials for laying around because I had, you have to make these for the dolly as well. I did make a dolly some time back. And then in the middle there's this overclocker upgrade. Now those of you who play Industrial Craft 2 regularly will probably not have a problem with this one. But this recipe can be confusing if you haven't. It requires... There's no problem with the cables and the circuits. All that information is available in NEI. If we look at the 10K coolant cell, you can see that it requires 10 plates and this coolant cell. The coolant cell is kind of a problem because it is showing that you need to put IC2 coolant into an empty cell and it'll give you a coolant cell using a bottler. This is not the recipe you use. It also shows that you can do the same thing with a uh, fluid transposer. This is not the recipe you use either. So those are the recipes it shows, and neither one of them is the one you use. And the problem, of course, is how do I get this IC2 coolant? Where does that come from? Here's basically what you really have to do. First of all, you need some of these empty cells. And to be absolutely clear, because it can be a point of confusion, there are these empty cells right here and the way you're going to make those is you're going to run a tin plate through a metal former using the extruding option and it will produce three empty cells. There is another type of cell that looks just the same called a universal fluid cell and it has a different recipe. Do not use this one this will not give you what you want. You want the empty cell. It's actually very confusing, but you want the empty cell, and that is how you get it, using the metal former. Once you have it, the way that you get the fluid is you're going to need a couple of IC2 machines. You're going to need a macerator, and you're going to put lapis in here, and it's going to make pulverized lapis. And then you're going to take eight of those in some water and put them in this fluid canning machine which actually has a very complicated interface. The mode that you want here is called fluid enrich and you can switch modes by clicking on this thing down here. It has a couple of tanks which you can swap back and forth by clicking switch tanks. So if you get some fluid in the wrong tank you can move it around. You're going to want to put some water in here. And I will go ahead and mention there is another recipe for these that requires fewer resources but more machines. I'm not going to cover that one. I'm going to cover the one that requires the least machines. And what's going to happen is you're going to end up with water in this tank over here and your empty cells in this location up here and your lapis will show up in this spot right here. And it will take eight lapis per bucket of water in this tank and what will happen is they will go through here and they'll get combined assuming you've powered the machine and so on 
and you will end up with one of these coolant cells in this side of the machine. The interface on this machine is pretty confusing. Be sure that you've clicked down here until you get fluid enriched. It's got all these other modes, canning, drain selling from tank, fill cell from tank, drain cell into tank, fluid enriched. You, you want the fluid enriched specifically and it will convert water plus lapis into um, IC2 coolant and put it in the cell for you. Once you've got that it's pretty straightforward to go ahead and make the 10k coolant cell. You're going to want to make three of them and then you can go ahead and make the overclocker upgrade. You'll get two of them if you if you use one of them to make a turtle you have one left over that you can put in a machine to speed it up. So that's the story on that. Um, the reason that I actually wanted the turtle is because building a platform like this one up here is not that bad because you're going up. But if you're going down, you really have to do a lot of tricks with floating around in water columns or um, using pistons to push down blocks and stuff like that. To get down here, I find that very time consuming and just don't like to do it. So I set up a little turtle program that will build the steps down and part of the foundation for this platform. Then I come down and finish it myself. So I can build down pretty easily with a turtle. Alright, so let's look at auto crafting since I have promised that. What I want to do is I want to go ahead and get started today. I've got a lot of uh, automated crafting already set up here. These are all rows of tables. The ones that don't have a pipe attached are still available. The ones with a pipe attached already have something programmed in. Let's take a quick look at one of these. If I look at this pipe, it shows that it is configured to make pistons. So I've got all the materials for pistons here as inputs, and then for the output it shows a piston. The way that was actually set up, if I clear all this stuff, is I set up the pattern for a piston in the attached crafting table. I went ahead and put the pipe on there and then I just hit import and it pulls that in. So it's actually very simple to configure these up. You need them attached to the network and it, it just makes these things and you have them available right away. So I'm going to need a couple more AutoCraft recipes going here for today's demonstration. So let me just go ahead and do that. Now I've got a module, a blank module already configured in here. Let's go ahead and request one of those. And let me go ahead and get an iron chipset. I'll request one of those. I'm going to need some form of blue dye. So let's request some of that. And then I'm going to need some form of red dye. So we'll request that. Now if I type in module here, you'll notice that I've just got the blank one. These materials have now shown up over here. I'm also going to need a, um, a crafting logistics pipe. Notice that these say zero. That means that the system knows how to craft them, but there are none in the system presently. So if I request one of these, it's going to go ahead and craft up one of those by requesting the appropriate materials, and it will send it down here. So now I've got one. Alright, so if I come over here to the crafting table that's available, and I put in the recipe for a... I think it's red on the top and blue down in this corner. This is a crafting module from Logistics Pipes. So I've programmed that into this table. If I attach a pipe and I take my wrench and I right click on the pipe and hit import, now the system knows how to make a logistics pipe crafting module. So I can just dump these back into the dump chest and come over here. And if I type module, it now shows both of these things. So I can go ahead and request one of those and it will think about it for a little bit and here one comes and there it is. So that's how you program these things in here. There are a couple of things that I would suggest for keeping this speedy. Do bear in mind that all of the materials that you 
use for crafting one of these have to go through a pipe system. They have to go through a pipe system to get to your crafting tables. Once they've arrived at the crafting tables, they've got to go through a pipe system to get back to, to their destination. You want to keep your crafting system close to your storage, and you want to keep it reasonably compact. You don't want to be crafting stuff all the way over on the other side of the base if you can avoid it because then it will have all of this pipe to go through and time constraints will be a problem. Now I've actually got stuff spread out all over this base right now but an important thing about that is that the stuff that's off in distant locations is all just making raw materials and sending them to storage and it's a very one-way sort of thing. Those areas are not involved in crafting anything. Right now I've got sugar cane stored over there, but eventually I'm going to need it to make paper and so forth. So I will probably eventually move sugar cane over to this storage bank instead of keeping it over in that one. It's not even being used over there, so that's fine. And just keep that in mind. The other thing that you probably want to keep in mind is that I'm using golden pipes everywhere throughout. You might have looked at that and thought it was expensive or something compared to just using cobblestone. That is true, but the golden pipes are much faster and don't experience slowdowns, and that's why I'm using them. It keeps everything nice and fast and running smoothly so that I don't have delays on crafting things that I don't want. All right, so what I'm actually wanting to set up here today is a system for producing gears. Now, up until now, I've been producing gears using the Tinker's Construct Smeltery, and I've just manually been producing them in the gear mold. And I could automate that. If I automated it, I would need two smelteries to make sure that I didn't accidentally alloy any metals. I mean, I would hate to ask for a tin gear and a copper gear at the same time and end up with with a bronze gear plus a bunch of plus maybe a little bit of extra leftover bronze that I didn't need plus a bunch of copper still sitting in the machine and have to go and clean up that mess. So in order to fix that, you would actually need two smelteries and make and you would have to have them set up using metals that don't alloy together so like maybe one could make iron and copper gears and another one could make tin gears and invar gears uh, yeah so, so it is doable there is another way to do it though and that is using a machine from immersive engineering if I pull out my manual here and it is called the metal press this machine will produce gears and plates and so it uses a mold to tell it what to make this is the metal plate mold and we'll probably do plates as well and this one is the gear mold the machine just uses some power and it takes ingots directly as its inputs and it outputs the appropriate gear or plate or whatever you have it configured for with the mold. The nice thing about this machine, not only does it not have this alloy prob problem, but it's faster and it uses power rather than lava in order to function. So I just really think it's a much better machine for this particular purpose. I am going to have to make some things for it. You already saw me set up a recipe for the um, crafting module for it. I'm also going to need some specialized pipes that I don't have. I don't think they're configured in this machine, so let me take a quick look here. I'm actually going to want not the crafting pipe. I'm going to need the satellite pipe and the Mark V logistics chassis. So let me set up recipes for those. And I'll be right back. I'm gonna, I was going to do it on camera, but I don't think I'm going to because of the lag issue right now. So I'll, I'll be right back when I have that set up. All right, I'm back. System seems to be behaving just a little bit right now. So let's look at what we're going to need. In order to make this metal press, we're, I'm going to make two of them. So I'm going to need six steel scaffolding, two pistons, four conveyor belts, and two heavy engineering blocks. Pistons, just requestable over the system, so I'm not going to... I've already got some here, I think. Um, but the other items I'm going to have to make. Right now, I'm not going to automate any of them because I don't know how many immersive engineering multi-block machines I'm going to make. 
it's probably not going to be a ton of them. I kind of prefer to use some of the other machines because I'm more familiar with the other mods. But if you thought you might be going to make, let's say, a lot of these machines, then you're probably going to need a lot of steel scaffolding, so you might automate making that. To look at these, uh, I'm going to need four conveyor belts. Uh, the recipe makes eight of them. It just involves some leather, some iron, and some redstone. Let's just reach up here and get a couple of iron since it's very close. Uh, redstone. Let's get a couple of red, or let's get a redstone. Uh, come over here to the crafting table. Redstone, iron. I have leather sitting in here because I've been killing cows. Pop that in there. We got our conveyor belts. Pistons. I have four pistons in there. That is what I'm going to need. And I guess uh, that means we're looking at the scaffolding. Steel scaffolding. Lots of steel involved in this. So it's three steel ingots on top of three steel fences. The steel fences are six steel rods. The steel rods are two steel ingots. Let's start out with this many and see if I need more. That may be all I need. So I need six total scaffolds. And really that takes care of it right there. So I've got lots of extra materials here because I was not counting that accurately. And that's fine. The other thing I need is the heavy engineering block. That's this right here. Four steel in the corners, pistons on the side, electrum in the middle. I do have some electrum and steel mechanical components top and bottom. Those are each four steel and one copper ingots. And I'm going to need four of them, right? Two. Well, the heavy engineering block recipe makes two, so I only need two of them. Two of those. And Electrum in the metal right there. So I think that's um that's what I'm gonna need for this. Let's just put this other stuff away. And come up here and construct them. So I'm going to allow a little bit of space between these. And I'll put one there. And one, I'll just put it right here. It's probably a lot further apart than they need to be. But it's better to have space and not need it than to need it and not have it. So I'll put the pistons down here. And twirl them to get them pointing down, which is the direction they're supposed to be. Now I'll go ahead and put the engineering blocks on top. And then I'm going to put the conveyors down last. And they can go in either direction here. I just have to figure out which direction I really want them to be in. And I think I'm going to put them over going in that direction. So I'll sneak up to the side here so I can get them pointed the way I want and put them over here. It's worth mentioning that I have specifically avoided putting down the conveyors until last because if you put them down early on when you're messing with some of this other stuff you might find that you need to jump on them and they will move you around and it's kind of a pain. Alright, so to get this finished I need my engineering hammer which I don't have with me. Where did I put that thing? I do have one, I just don't know where it is. I guess I'll be back when I find it. Got it? Okay, in order to get these machines finally functioning, you whack the piston, I believe, with the hammer. There we go. And so the multi-block has formed. Just like that. It's magic. Uh, and so now I really do have to jump on top of the conveyors, but the machine is already completely built, so I think I can probably get on and off there pretty easily. 
um, and that's to hook up power. So these, these want power on the top. You can see an orange dot up there. So we got one on there. Come over here. Got one there. And so I'm going to go ahead and hook up power to them. For now, I'll just put a power tap on the end of this thing. I'll come up with a better arrangement for that at some point, but just for demonstration at the moment. So we'll string a wire up here. Maybe. There we go. And I'll go ahead and you could go straight across, but I'm going to do them in parallel rather than in series. So now we have the machines actually hooked up. Now we just have to automate them. And the way to automate these is through the use of uh, hoppers and chests. So let me get some hoppers and chests here. I'll need a couple of hoppers. And I can just request a couple of chests out of the logistics system. It actually already has a couple in here, so I'll just grab them directly. Alright, so on the output side, this, these conveyors can insert directly into chests. So I'll just put a chest there. And there. On the input side, it will not take items directly out of chests, but hoppers can insert into it. So I'll put a hopper here and a hopper here. So stuff that falls out of the hopper will land on the conveyor, go through the central core of the machine where it gets processed. The resulting product will come out and go into the chest right here. Now to automate this, I'm going to be using the chassis pipe Mark V with crafting modules in it and the satellite logistics pipe. And this machine is actually a great machine for illustrating how the crafting system in logistics pipe works with satellite pipes. And what a satellite pipe does is it allows you to send some of the materials for the crafting process, or in this case all of them, to some other location. The trick here that this system really illustrates well is that the finished product always has to appear on the end where you've got the crafting configured, not on the satellite end. The satellite end should never have the finished product showing up. So let's go ahead and put the satellite over on the hopper side and the logistics chassis mark 5 over here where the crafting modules are going to be over here on the output side now i'll connect these up using some golden pipes and let's go ahead and So I have an intersection here, and I will eventually have an intersection here, and so those require basic logistics pipes for routing everything. So I'll put that there, and that there. So to configure these things appropriately, what I want to do is just do a little testing here with um, some copper ingots. So I want to make a copper gear. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put one of these crafting modules in this slot right here, and I'm going to tell it that it's consuming copper gears. The important point here is that it's consuming them, it wants to send them to the satellite pipe. So I'm going to have to give the satellite pipe a number, in this case it's satellite pipe 1. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it that it's sending to satellite one four copper ingots. And it's, so it's going to send four copper ingots over here. They're going to fall through the machine. They're going to come through the center where nothing is going to happen because I haven't put a mold in yet, but I will. And um, the resulting product, if anything actually were happening, would come over here and produce a finished product. And I don't have a copper gear on hand, so I can't tell it, but if I would put a copper gear right here. Let's go ahead and make a gear mold. To do that, I'm going to need some sort of gear and uh, some refined iron or steel plates. And I'll just come over here to the crafting table, put in my gear and my steel plates like that. This gives me a metal press mold gear. And I can bring that up here. And you basically just click it right there. And so now you can sort of see that metal press is there so we can see how it's configured visually. What would happen here is we would, four ingots would go over to this end, get inserted into the hopper. You can see the ingot sort of flowing through there through the pipe and a gear just got stamped and came over and is now sitting in this chest. So just to finish up the recipe here I can come over here and I can put this gear here. Now um, the system knows that four copper ingots make a copper gear. And this is all hooked up and working now so let's come over here and see what happens. If I tell this that I want a copper gear. So I'm going to request it. And copper is going to go over there, which is kind of a long ways. You can sort of see it going through there if, if you're, I don't know if it will show up in YouTube. It's kind of small. Um, but it just stamped the gear. And it just spat it out. And so it's coming back along the network and will end up in this chest. And here it comes. So there we go. We can now automatically make copper gears from this extra machine. The other item that we're going to want to set up is plates. And plates are kind of an interesting one because normally these, this machine makes a slightly different form of plate for a lot of things than the industrial craft machine does. And for most purposes, they are or dictionary, so they're interchangeable. Not in all cases. Um, I think that if you want to do chest upgrades in the laser, for example, it will not accept the ones from this machine. So we'll still have to have some IC2 machine set up to do that sort of thing. But I do want to have plates through this machine whenever I can. I prefer them over the IC2 plate making machine because this machine is a lot faster. I've configured this to make plates. Let's come over here and tell it I want to make. For now I'll just go ahead and stick with copper. So if I come over here and put in a crafting module and I tell it it's one input on the satellite pipe which I am going to have to configure a number for over here. So, satellite pipe 2, 2, make sure you send it to the correct satellite pipe because it will do you no good to send the copper to the machine that's making gears if you want plates. And just so that I have the appropriate plate to register for the thing, I'm going to have it come through here. Plate shows up. It did make the IC2 version for this one. And so this makes copper plates. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the episode at this point, And I will see you next time. Thank you for watching.